Welcome to another episode of Sports and Songs podcast. Today is August 21st, 2021. We're on season two, episode 39, Andy. And how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you? Good. We are the hosts, Dan and Andy, for the for our weekly show here. We're going to cover some sports, music, concerts, trivia questions, and um, get the person of the week this week. Person of the week, the soapbox. We're going to get everyone up to speed here as we call this an educational show to get everyone up to speed here. And don't forget yeah. we're the fastest growing podcast in all of Western Harbor County. Right. It's, it's really taking off. Um, what have you got? Should I start off with a trivia question? Trivia question, then we'll dive into my nonsense. So dive into your nonsense after this. The trivia question relates to Byron Buxton. Uh, you know, he's down AAA St. Paul Saints uh, on a rehab assignment. Officially, he's out on a 10 day injured list. But I was always been intrigued of how good of a ball player he was in the minors and how average to some extent he's been in the majors, um, batting average wise. Uh, the guy's a stud in the minors at every level. Um, he was a stud. My question today is what's his lifetime batting average in the minors versus what's his lifetime batting average in the majors? That's the question today. Don't get me wrong. The guy's a good, a good hitter in the majors. He's really come on this year, hitting for power, yeah. and else, but struggled for many years just simply with batting average. Uh, but boy, was boy was he one of the best ever in the Twins farm system for uh, for batting average. And the thing I like about the minor league team being here now, if you notice a lot of the guys when they go for their ten day rehab, it's during their seven day home stretch, and then they, they just don't travel and play those other three days. You know, it, so it's, it's kind of a nice advantage. Very convenient. And then I saw, too, you know, the Saints were advertising it also to help sell tickets yesterday, saying, hey, yeah, they didn't help. and they went out of their way in the headline to say he will be in the lineup as well. So they're trying to beef up some ticket sales as well. So, all right, that's well, a great the help with that. Jeez. All right, go all ahead right. with your nonsense, Andy. With the rest of my bit here, let me do my – production stuff here and I hit that button I close this button here all right here we are this is us the CFL um here we're doing the show today on a Saturday morning so there's only a couple games done for week three but here we go the Thursday and Friday games are in and complete the Edmonton Elks over BC and the Calgary Stampeders over the Montreal Alouettes two games today Winnipeg and Toronto, Ottawa and Saskatchewan. Uh, YouTube and the CFL site, you can catch all those games. Interested? Through two and a half weeks, here's their standings. Saskatchewan and Winnipeg up there. Uh, Edmonton and BC and Calgary, all three games played at the one and two mark. And in the East, Ottawa undefeated 1-0. and One and one for Montreal and Toronto and Hamilton. Well, they're Hamilton. College football, before we get into some of the other preseason rankings, CBS Sports is reporting the Big Ten, the ACC, and the Pac-12. The Big Ten that has 14 teams, the Pac-12 with 10 teams, ACC, I don't know how many they got. Those three are going to be combining an alliance to kind of combat the SEC expansion. The SEC, as you know, in a couple of years, is going to be adding Texas and Oklahoma. Um, so... To combat this, those three conferences, Big Ten, ACC, and Pac-12, are going to kind of combine for some TV schedules, some games, see what they could do to uh, make life a little easier for everybody else, more enjoyable, so it's not just SEC rules. So get ready for that. Get ready to see some more. I don't know if that's going to take away the games of, like, you know, the Gophers against, you know, St. Mary's School of the Blind in the preseason. They might have to play Oregon instead, but we'll see how that goes. Now, Andy, what's the what's the league going to be called this season? Well, they're gonna they're gonna be keeping it all. The Big Ten has fourteen teams in it, so don't look at your standings and be all confused. I think the Pac-12 has like ten teams, so these schools have to like combine. Okay. And I know there's been a lot of talk of trying to get Notre Dame into the Big Ten just for football. Yeah. Notre Dame's already in there for hockey, um, but they love their independent because they get that big TV contract with NBC. Yeah. Well, the way SEC is going. NBC might sweeten that pot for uh, Notre Dame. Big Ten with the Big Ten Network. I think that's got a little ESPN money in it. They can't throw – I don't know how they couldn't throw more Notre Dame one. 
join the Big Ten for football. But if they don't, maybe a lot of the Big Ten teams can play Notre Dame and, you know, kind of throw them in the mix. I know Michigan and Notre Dame have their game every year. Maybe Notre Dame could play Michigan and Minnesota, then Michigan and Wisconsin, Ohio State, you know, one other Big Ten team a year to make it fun, TV-wise, you know. So here we go. Here is the preseason college top eight. Alabama one, Oklahoma two, who was a uh, finished sixth last year, as you see. Clemson, the Ohio State, Georgia AM, Iowa State, and Cincinnati are your top eight preseason. And FCS, Sam Houston defending champs number one. James Madison two. The Jackrabbits are at third. There's the Bison at four. And North Dakota coming in at eight. But there's your uh, preseason top eight for FCS. And also NCAA women's volleyball. Top eight preseason. There's the Gophers at number seven. Um, Gophers usually have a pretty good team every year. They've made the final four a few of the last two tournaments. Uh, they're always up there. Good, fun team to watch. You see 16 and three last year. Uh, the Badgers at number two. So there's some Big Ten represented Purdue at eight, Nebraska five. So we're, if you're into the ladies volleyball, we got four teams in the top eight right there. Worth the watch. Minor league baseball. Got some notes and standings on that. First of all, Joe Ryan made his Saints debut uh, in a win the other day. Uh, he pitched four innings, struck out nine. Uh, gave up one home run. It was the only hit he gave up. And Brian Buxton, uh, as you mentioned earlier, just for the Saints this year, he's got four games played, batting 455. There you go. Just his numbers for minors are just unreal. Just stay healthy and don't crash into the wall, Mr. Buxton. Uh, Andy, with that yes. Joe Ryan debut. Yes. Um, he only pitched the four innings, I think 67 pitches. They pulled him out. They were way ahead. You know, he didn't get the win. Um, but he, he didn't pitch five innings, but. He struck out the first six batters he faced. Yeah. Open the game. So he'll be fun to watch. He'll be okay, I think. He'll do just fine. And here is the AAA East Midwest Division. There's the Saints a half game out, plugging right along, trying to catch up to Toledo. And like I said, look at those top three teams, the Tigers, the Twins, and the Royals. Their major league teams aren't doing well, but these minor league teams are doing pretty good. Pittsburgh's up there, the Cubs, the I Cubs up there. So those might be the pro teams to watch in a couple, three years if these guys all make it up. Here's the Saints schedule for the rest of the week. They got the next two here at home against the I Cubs. Then they go to Toledo. If you look back here at the standings, Toledo's the one in first. So that's going to be a next fun week. Um, follow the Saints online. We'll be trying to update their games daily on our social media pages. And here's the AAA East division. There's the Mets holding down last place. Seven and three in their last 10. Those three are doing well. A little late, but doing well. Toronto and the Yankees in Boston, top three. You'd think it was the American League East, but nope. And look, Boston's minor league team is doing bad in the last 10 games too. We'll get to that later. Here's how the playoffs work for AAA. And we're just going to worry about the AAA one now. Each branch of the minors is different. AAA 2021 regular season champion will be crowned in both the East and the West based on highest overall winning percentage throughout the regular season. Then they have a pool of other games. It's really kind of being new to it. It's going to take a little bit used to, but it is easier than it looks once you start following it. Here is all of AAA East's three divisions. In the East, you got Buffalo first half game lead the southeast durham's running away with it so that's why i listed just the durham bulls there they had like a six game lead and then you got toledo and the saints so winning percentage wise it looks like durham's gonna get that top seed no matter what and then buffalo will probably get a second seed unless someone here from the midwest can pour it on that's why this week's games with uh, toledo and st paul could be very important in this major league baseball I got some news and notes before we get into other stuff Fox is reporting thrown out there. Should Major League Baseball have a mercy rule for teams up by 10 after seven innings? 
I know we've kind of talked about this, how I'm not a big fan of position players pitching in the ninth inning. It kind of makes a mockery of it. If there could be a, a mercy rule or throwing the white flag after seven or eight innings. If they did, I, I, I don't know how fans would react to that. You, you paid for nine innings, at least eight and a half if the home team's winning. You don't mind giving up that half inning if your home team wins. But if someone's getting throttled by 10, most of the crowd is left already anyway. Beer sales are done. If it's after seven innings and the losing, in my opinion, it'd have to be the losing manager, I'd say, here, we're throwing in the white flag. It's been fun. It's been real. Um, I'd like to see them have the option, though. Because say you're down by 11, but you got a guy on your team who's got a 38-game hitting streak going, and he's up next, and he's 0 for 3. You might want to give him one more at bat. So um, maybe call it after seven innings. Could be a discretion, not an automatic. We'll see how that rule a, works out and how it kicks around. I have a question on that, Andy. <clears throat> yeah. and that, that brings up a good point, too, because I don't mind the, the 10 run uh, rule after, you know, after seven in a nine inning game, but it opens the door for these seven inning double headers. If it's a 10 run, right. is it now five? Uh, you know, we do that in a senior, senior, yeah. band. five, uh, five innings is all you need for a, uh, in a seven inning regular game. If it's 10 runs now, like you had mentioned, you may give the manager the option to, right. to, to keep going or, or not. And that's fine enough. Uh, makes sense. But some teams, want to know ahead of time if they're up by eight or nine, should we pour it on and try to get to that 10 run spot to end it? And then if they, if they know going in that the, uh, the other coach isn't going to in, in buy into that, then, you know, what's, what's the matter. So you almost need to know ahead of time. So there's some confusion in the, the strategy. Um, well, and also say it's the sixth inning and you're up by 11. Do you bring your closer in to make sure they don't score another run or two? So you can hopefully get the forfeit after seven innings. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's 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 has to be almost a hard and fast rule, but I do like the option. But then when do you when is yep. the option um, available? You know. So. Yep. All right. That's interesting, though. Yeah. Uh, Chris Davis of the Orioles is done stealing money from them. He's going to retire. Um, he's been horrible the last few years since he signed his big contract. He is now and. They call it the Bobby Bonilla rule, which other players are doing it beforehand and we covered before others have done it since. He will be paid out the rest of his $65 million in installments like this. Uh, next year, he'll get $23 million. For the next three years, he'll get $9.6. Then from 26 through 32, he'll get $3.5 million. And 33 through 37, $1.4. Now, being a guy who lives check to check, this is going to be hard to say, but when you look at what ball players are getting paid, especially by the time 2026 comes around, What's three and a half million dollars? That's nothing for a salary. Really, even the next few years, nine nine million ain't gonna be much for a salary. So it's not that big a hit. It's just the Orioles are in dead last place, and I think me, you, and seven other guys could probably beat them right now. So sixty five million would be a big hit right now to cut a check. And also that salary cap reasons how it all hits you and everything else. That's why they break these things down. But Chris Davis has hung it up. There's his. Paychecks of the year 2037. That's a nice little retirement plan, too, because he can't blow it all away. He's still got something coming in. Like we said, by the time 2037 comes around for baseball salaries, what's 1.4 million? Here we go. Major League Baseball. Funny. Another guy was uh, had some sticky stuff on him. Uh, here it is. Uh, I'm going to Caleb Smith of the Diamondbacks was found with sticky stuff on his glove. He's like, I'm not an idiot. It's nothing wrong. It's just dirt on the glove. And they got all upset and they tossed him. And there, there's the umpire taking the glove to major league offices to be inspected. Um, I'm not saying they need something like what the police have to do a drug test right there on the glove to see what it is. Yes, send it off to get it done. But some of this, I think, is a good, and it was Arizona. No offense. Really, your, your, your season's over. But it's the principle that they're still doing this this late. I'm not saying if it's Arizona and Pittsburgh, don't bother. Who cares? But it's stuff on there. Give these umps better training to tell if it's just dirt, just dirt and sweat on the glove. Or is it something on there? They're just going, oh, there's something on the glove and tossing them. That's insane. They got to give these umps some better training, I think, on that. 
to avoid issues like this going in the next year. So let's hope in the off season the umps get trained on what's what. Here we go into the standings. Uh, like we said, there's there's Baltimore, 36 games out. Um, Tampa, the Yankees coming on strong. They always do this time of year. And Boston, not. White Sox making their play, uh, getting their playoff plans ready, trying to stay healthy there. Five and five in the last ten, staying healthy. Cleveland and Detroit, Minnesota and Kansas City rounding it off there. Oh, again, it looks like everybody's playing about 500 ball. It's kind of ho-hum. Merkley League East, there's the Rangers, 30 games out. We got Houston, Oakland, Seattle. Seattle's still chipping away at it there. Little by little, we'll see if they could uh, make a run for it here at the end. National League East, yes, the Mets are six out, two games below 500. Like we said on the schedule a couple weeks ago, this is going to be make or break. Looks like they're breaking. Right now, now how, how is Brett Lana? How's uh Eddie Rosario doing? I haven't been following. Him. I haven't seen his numbers. No, I know Freddie Freeman's been playing like a beast lately. Oh, yes, I got him on fantasy. So, thank you, Freddie Freeman. Um, nine and one in the last 10, seven game streak. They're, they're just clicking right now. Um, as long as the Mets finish ahead of Philadelphia, so to me, the Mets are two games behind right now. I, I'd love to see him win it, don't get me wrong, but just be ahead of Philadelphia for crying out loud. Central. Cincinnati, that wild card games behind zero. Get to that in a second here. Been calling them all year. Watch out for Cincinnati. Milwaukee still just kind of plugging along there. And the whole home number they're seven and three in the last ten games for Milwaukee, and that includes losing two in a row. So they've been pretty hot lately. And there's uh, the Cubs in Pittsburgh having fun at the bottom. In the East, the Padres have fallen. Um, Two and eight in the last 10, and the Dodgers are red hot. But then again, the Dodgers have been playing the Mets, so we'll see how that – and then there's Arizona, like I said, 37 and a half out. Yeah, I could see the pitcher being upset for the stuff on his glove, but now you're in the pennant race, kids. Here we go at the pennant race. Yankees and A's are the two wild cards teams right now. Boston, half game out. Seattle and Toronto, four and five and a half out. The wild card standings there. National League right now, Cincinnati and San Diego are tied, so they'd have a play-in game, if you will. Cincinnati six and four in the last ten. The Padres two and eight. There's the Cardinals, Phillies, and Mets rounding off. But look at St. Louis seven and three, three and a half out of that last spot. San Diego keeps dropping. It might be Cincinnati and St. Louis for that play-in game. So that would be exciting. And here's what I'm saying: July fourth, the Yankees were in fourth place. In the AL East, a 500 record of 41 and 41. Boston had the best record at 53 and 32. Now the Yankees have jumped in front of Boston for second in the wild card spot. And if the season ended today, Boston would not be in the playoffs. So that whole if you're in first place by July 4th situation, Boston's kind of proven that wrong. Also, teams with 12 plus game losing streaks this year. Congratulations to both Arizona and Baltimore for doing it twice. And the Cubs and the Rangers in that little fun group. Here is the playoff brackets for the series. So you can start getting your vacation days at work. The wildcard games start October 5 and 6. Then 7 through 14 is a division. Now, this is the way it works. This is because of TV, unlike back in the day. If that division round, if all those teams sweep in three games – you still got to wait to the 15th for the next round. So, I mean, I remember as kids, it used to be, you're both done, play on two days later. But now we because of TV contracts, we have to wait. As the World Series, we could take it into November 3rd if the World Series goes seven games. Uh, here, Ken Rosenthal is also reporting Major League Baseball, not only a seven-inning forfeit rule, salary cap, Minimum of 100 million and a new tax for teams spending over 180 million or more. Now, I didn't look up some of the stats, but I'd like to know Kansas City, Minnesota, if they're even close to 100 million minimum. I know the Astros about seven years ago, that's what they did. They gutted everybody. But now look where they are. So it might prevent teams from doing that too, with 100 million minimum. Major League Baseball has its little league classic coming up. 
Um, I, they play at a major league field that's in Pennsylvania where the little league sites are. I've always said I like this better than the Field of Dreams games. I think it's more fun. It's better for the league. And Field of Dreams had different uniforms this year, which everybody ripped on. Everybody ripped on the All-Star game jerseys this year. Now, if you're familiar with Little League, you'll understand this next picture. I like what Major League Baseball is doing for Little League. It's Los Angeles and Cleveland, teams in the Great Lakes and the West Divisions if you're in the Little League. So they're going to wear what their Little League jerseys would be from that town. So I think that's pretty neat. Kind of gives the kids a little more, hey, that would be our team if we were, you know, a little more, you could associate with them better. So I think that's a great idea they did that. Uh, Cleveland wearing the Great Lakes jerseys and the Angels wore the West jerseys. I think that's pretty cool. Finally, baseball got it right. You dropped the ball at the All-Star game. You blew out the Field of Dreams game. Nice rebound. Re, 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 the Mets. Here we go. Start off with some good news. Francisco Alvarez right now is in the top 10 for – number 10 for top 100 prospects, according to Major League Baseball's channel. Uh, there's some minor league names to watch for in the next few years. Bobby Witt Jr. for Kansas City at shortstop. Keep an eye on him. Um, unlike his old man who was a pitcher, very good serviceable pitcher, Bobby Witt Jr., great shortstop. Keep an eye on him. Like I said, Alvarez for the Mets at catcher. You know, the Mets have signed a catcher to a big deal. You can always be moved to first base or the outfielder traded. So keep an eye on some of these names. If your favorite team is up there, um, don't see a lot of, don't see any Twins players up there, but this might be a pre Joe Ryan trade too. So Noah Syndergaard, Thor, as we like to call him. Uh, he's on board with going into the bullpen in September. Uh, Syndergaard really says Tommy John surgery hasn't said boo to the media. He puts a lot of stuff on Twitter, which is a good, he's a good follow on Twitter. Pretty funny guy. Um, when he was asked Thursday, the idea of serving as a reliever down the stretch, once he makes his long way to return from Tommy John surgery, Syndergaard did not hesitate. Whatever is needed me, he said. Then he got up and left the press conference. That's all he said since his surgery. Now, keep in mind, he's uh, only pitched twice out of the bullpen, once in the playoffs in 2015, then once a year later after he was ejected early in the game, came back and pitched a bullpen the next day. Syndergaard's a free agent at the end of the year. He missed all of last year, which was a shortened season, and might miss all of this year because of Tommy John. So he might want to come back and pitch bullpen just to see how the arm feels. He's a free agent. Don't know what the Mets are going to sign with him. <clears throat> Excuse me, if they're going to re-sign him or not. They have not said boo. Again, want to see how this rehab goes. He's been pulled in a couple of rehab starts because of issues or injuries and tightness and stuff. So we shall see. Uh, Mr. Syndergaard may not be a Met next year. But if he is, I don't think he'll be getting a big paycheck he wants to get. Again, go back to last week's show. Did I not say sit Jacob DeGrom down for the season? Funny, now the Mets are reporting they might shut Jacob DeGrom down for the season. With this being said, I now know who one of our listeners in New York is. It's the Mets. They're listening to me. Exactly. <clears throat> I figured it out. <coughs> said this last week, and now they're saying they might shut him down. Again, you've dropped to six games out in the last three weeks. It's not worth it. Set him down. Let's get healthy. Still under the Mets news, but also by person of the week. Jerome Martin Kuzman, Jerry Kuzman, pitcher for the Mets. American League professional baseball player, played in the major leagues with the Mets, the Twins, the White Sox, and the Phillies between 67 and 85. He's best known for his years with the Miracle Mets in 69. And here's the one thing where, like I told Dan in the pre-show meeting, I'm putting on my WCCO hat. Jerry Kuzman being from Minnesota originally, one of us. Um, <clears throat> he was discovered by the son of a Shea Stadium usher who caught Kuzman when he pitched for the United States Army at Fort Bliss, Texas. The Mets offered him a contract after that, after he was discharged from the Army, and then he was part of the Mets in 66. Uh, Joe McDowell, the assistant farm director, requested Kuzman be retained at least until his first payday. 
He was owed the Mets money when he was wired it to him after his car broke down and brought the spring training. So he's on his way to spring training. Hasn't even pitched for him yet. Had to take a loan from the team. <laughs> and they said, let's let him stay until the first payday so we get our money back out of him first. And good thing they did. Oh, um, you know, so just – you always hear those stories of the guy who gets called up. I think Puckett's story was he had to take a cab and borrow money from the guys in the clubhouse to pay the cab, you know. And that worked out for his career. Um, <clears throat> here's some more stuff on Jared Kuzman. After leading the International League pitchers with strikeouts in 1967, Kuzman, Kuzman broke into the Mets rotation in 68. Went 19 and 12 with a record with seven shutouts, 178 Ks, and a 2.0 ERA. The wins, strikeouts, and ERA set franchise records, breaking those set by teammate Tom Seaver the prior year. So off to a good start right there by breaking Tom Seaver's records. Um, the National League won the game. Uh, he was in the All-Star game when they won one nothing. To date, the only All-Star game to end one nothing. In the pitcher of the year, Kuzman pitched a scoreless ninth, striking out Carl Yastrzemski for the final out. So that's pretty impressive right there. Kuzman posted a 15 and 11 record in 74 and 14 and 13 and 75. 76, he possibly had his best season ever, establishing career bests with 21 wins against 10 losses, 200 Ks. He also finished ran, runner up to Randy Jones for Cy Young. In 77, the Mets traded Seaver to the Reds. The remainder of the team disorientated, especially Kuzman, who slumped to 8 and 20, finishing tied with Phil Negro for most losses in the National League. After a 3-15 season in 78, Kuzman, seeing no immediate improvement in the team, was traded to the Minnesota Twins at his request. His departure left Ed King Brule to be the remaining member of the 69 Miracle Mets after Seaver returned to the Mets in the 83 season. In the trade to descend Kuzman to the, Met, to the Twins, the Mets acquired Jesse Orozco in the trade. Roscoe's been a player to be named later who went on to be the Mets to the Mets to complete the deal, which had been made two months earlier. So Jesse Roscoe, those of you who know the Mets, got the final out in the 86 World Series, striking him out. Roscoe, one of the best relievers the Mets had in the 80s, so he could have been one of us, but we got Jerry Kuzman instead in that trade. That player to be named later guy always comes up. Uh, Kuzman rebounded in 79 with a 20 and 13 record and went 16 and 13 in 1980. On August 30th, 1981, less than a month after the 81 players strike ended, the Twins traded Kuzman for the White Sox. He went 4-13 that season, <clears throat> again finishing tied for the league lead in losses. Uh, he rebounded, posted identical 11-7 records in 82 and 83. Later that year, the White Sox won the American League West title to make their first postseason appearance since 1959 World Series. However, the Baltimore Orioles defeated the White Sox in four games, after the season, Kuzman was traded to the Phillies, where he went 14 and 15 in 84, his last productive season. April 13, 1984, Kuzman gave up a double to Pete Rose for his 4,000th hit. With 222 wins, he is tied with Hook Duas for 72nd all time on the list. He ended his career at 222 and 209 record, 3.36 ERA in 612 games. He struck out just over 2,500 batters just short of 4,000 innings pitch. Uh, Kuzman was inducted in the Mets Hall of Fame in 89. He attended the 40th anniversary of the 69 Miracle Mets at City Field, August 22nd, 2009. Uh, also, as far as Twins go, he holds the record back, 1980, most strikeouts in a game by a pitcher, 15. So, Jerry Kuzman there. Why would I pick Jerry Kuzman? Well, the Mets... I'm going to be retiring his number this season. So here's just some Mets facts about Jerry Kuzman, number 36. Uh, there's some of his career numbers, 69 World Series, 76, Cy Young runner-up, two-time All-Star. 140 wins, third all-time in franchise history, most for a left-handed pitcher. <clears throat> Seaver's got 198, good in 157. Of current players, DeGrom is ninth with 77. 346 starts with the Mets, second all-time in franchise history behind Tom Seaver, who had 395. To put that in comparison today, active players, number eight, DeGrom with 198. Complete games, 108, second all-time behind Tom Seaver, 171. I was like number 30 all-time list for complete games, no one active because no one pitches a complete game anymore. 
I thought that list, I think number eight was Frank Viola with 12. So strikeout, 1799 for the Mets, third all time. Behind Seaver with 2541 and good with 1875. Uh, to put that in perspective for current guys, DeGrom is fourth at 1505. And Syndergaard is 12th at 775. Um, also, he's got – he had the second most for the Mets consecutive scoreless inning streak at 31 and two-thirds innings back at 73. R.A. Dickey broke that in 2012 with 32 and two-thirds. There was his number 36, will be retired by the Mets in August. We put up on the wall up there. Along with number 31, Mike Piazza, number 41, Tom Seaver, number 14, Joe Hodges, and number 37, Casey Stengel. You also see off to the side there, Ralph Kiner. Yes, he played for the Pirates, but he announced for the Mets for many, many years. And they retired, they retired him as an announcer. They didn't obviously retire his number. You don't see up there. Yes, the Mets did retire 42, like Jackie Robinson's number, like everybody else has in Major League Baseball. Which gives me the numbers, like I said, here. Piazza, 31. Uh, retired July 30th, 2016, 220 home runs, and 655 RBIs during his Mets career. Seven-time All-Star at the Mets, highest slugging percentage in team history, 396 career home runs, most all-time by a catcher. Elected in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2016. And there's the Jackie Robinson ones, retired in 97 with the rest of baseball, and he played with the Brooklyn Dodgers. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, Seavers had 41, retired at Chase Stadium July 24th and 88, won 311 games over 20, 20 seasons. Rookie of the Year in 67, three times Cy Young, nine time All Star, Hall of Fame in 92. Gil Hodges man managed the 1969 Miracle Mets uh, to their championship in just his second season, third winning as manager in Mets history. He was their manager from 68 to 71. He hit the club's first home run off Larry Jackson, by the way. Casey Stengel, uh, number 37, retired in 1965. He was the first manager in club history. Elected at 66 of the Hall of Fame and inducted in the Mets Hall of Fame in 81. Minnesota Twins news. Note, that's the logo from 1991 I use all the time. Just That's kind of important because 30 years later, they celebrated the 91 team at Target Field. There's a bunch of the guys who didn't make it down there. Some look like they could still maybe, maybe go. Some not so much. Here's just some pictures from the 91 season to jog your memories. That one in the upper corner for those of you watching. For you young kids, those are pictures from what we call a newspaper. We used to have those back in the day, how we got our news and information. Um, but there's some newspaper pictures. There's Gene Larkin with his home run. Kirby Puckett in Game 6, Morris. Jack Morris, John Smoltz, Game 7, 91. You need to go back and watch that game at least three times a year. The best game in World Series history. I don't care what anyone says. Minnesota State Fair. We're getting some music and concert stuff now here. <clears throat> Here's some concerts coming up at the State Fair here in Minnesota, the 26th through September 6th. Uh, Miranda Lambert, that got rescheduled. It's now going to be the Thursday night concert. Uh, Marie Morris, Lake Street Dive on Saturday. TLC and something called Shaggy. I don't know what a Shaggy is. That's on Sunday. The Spinners, Monday, August 30th. And the Doobie Brothers, Michael McDonald, back playing with the Doobies on Tuesday. Tim McGraw uh, is going to be there on the 1st. The Chainsmokers on the second, Kevin Costner in the Modern West on the third, George Thurgood on Saturday the fourth with Night Ranger opening up for him. So that would be a good show. And like I said to somebody else before, in my opinion, I love both Night Ranger and George Thurgood, but Thurgood should be opening for Night Ranger. There I said it. And Darcy Lane on the seventh. Nine Inch Nails said to cancel all their shows due to COVID-19. So if you had concert tickets for them or plan and see them somewhere in the country, check your venue, check for getting uh, rain checks on that and how they're handling that situation. But a lot of bands are starting to cancel. Blues Traveler <clears throat> was in town this week, kind of. 
Blues Traveler tour, tour bus crashed Thursday morning in Minnesota as the group was on their way to Rochester. And Rochester was for a show with J.J. Gray on Friday night. The good news is the members of the band are okay. This morning, our tour bus went off the road and crossed the median, stated Blues Traveler in an announcement on the Blues social media feeds. Thankfully, we were all safe and only sustained minor injuries. Our sincere gratitude to the Winona, Minnesota Police Department and rescue crew for their help, getting us safely off the highway and out of incoming traffic. So, Blues Travelers fans, well, Minnesota News are, I do not know if they made the concert Friday night. I did not follow up on that. My, my apologies. But all is well with them. They're back on the road. Scott Stapp of Creed will be performing September 11th in Menominee. Um, so if you want to go to tribute blue music concert.com the information on that to see if that show he's still out there performing and corn singer jonathan davis tested positive for the for the bobo um so they've had to change some of their 2021 tour plans so if you're going to see corn check their website check their information for changes there so uh also keep that in mind other other bands might be changing things i know um <clears throat> What's their name? Food Fighters are kind of saying no shot, no come in type of situation. So check with your favorite bands. Check with the venues. Um, a lot of these are kind of going state by state, too. I know getting ready for high school stuff, high school sports and college sports, uh, like high school hockey, for example. Minnetonka Hockey is at the Braemar Arena, which is city-owned, and the city says masks. Even though the school may say no, the city says yes, it's a city arena. So as we get ready for high school sports, like we said last year, just check weekly on what the situation is, policies, this and that, just like with everything else we have to do right now. It being a sporty event, a concert, a restaurant, traveling. It's a moving target and what we got to do all the time. So um, we do have high school sports coming up. Uh, some areas are saying teams are going to have to mask, some not. So again, keep that in mind. Uh, I really got Ethel's concert wise. So, like I said, those three uh, had to change, or two had to change because of COVID. Uh, we mentioned the Foo Fighters. A lot of guys still doing online concerts, like Scott St Step is there from Creed. So, follow your favorite bands, follow your favorite radio stations for stuff. Uh, we try to post a lot of that on our social media also, of concerts like that. So, keep an eye on us and follow us. We'll let you know what's going on. But, uh, you went to a, a rainout last night, sir, for town ball. Yeah, let's see. A Class C amateur baseball tournament, along with Class B, started last night. Opened up uh, three sites, Chaska, Hamburg, and Waconia. And uh, as, as great of the, the, the weather all week, right about game time is when the showers came through and thunderstorms and whatnot. Um, and so some games were further along than the others, but – they all had impacted. I was at the Waconia game. That was the St. Clair Wood Ducks against the Young America Cardinals. They got a, an hour delay and then got going and had two outs in the top of the first when the rains came again. And then after, I think about another hour, they determined it was going to be too wet to play even when and if the rain stopped. And so they, they, uh, they, shut, they shut her down last night. They shut her down. They so, waited an hour, you said? Yeah, an hour to start, mm -hmm. and then everyone yep. sat through another hour, I believe. Um, and then by that time, they made a public announcement saying it's 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 too wet. So uh, the the rains are really coming down. Uh, I checked; it was little over a quarter of an inch of rain came down in that two hour period, uh, roughly. So it, it was coming down. It was windy, lots of lightning as well. But boy, they had a nice nice thing tent set up in Waconia for all your food. Your grilled items are all off back. The normal concession stand is just for snacks, candy, and popcorn. There was various uh, places to buy beer and programs, and uh, they had it set up really good, I thought. So um, it was a nice, nice, uh, nice setup. Big crowd on hand, too. So I was looking forward to seeing that. For those of you who did go, if you keep your ticket, they're going to replay that game um, Sunday night at 7 o'clock in Watonia. And so your tickets will still be good to get you back into that. And, um, but that's it. Picked up the, the program, the, the week, the, uh, 
little wet. There it is. You know, it, the, the program here went in. through a lot last night, and uh, it, it was wet. Of course, I didn't bring an umbrella or anything, so um, it was kind of soaked down to the bone. But uh, everyone was huddled underneath the stadium section, but the wind was coming at an angle, so you were getting hit from both sides uh, a little, depending on where you were sitting. So it was, it was wet. That's going to be a good game, um, as I do believe this first round opening weekend, you're going to see some – potential blowouts, I think, this this weekend. So they're going to push those games back. But this weekend, Saturday and Sunday for Class C, it's the opening opening round. Single elimination. Losers go home. The winners will advance to the round of 32, which will be what I personally consider my favorite weekend of the tournament is that next weekend. This weekend, they all just play the one, the one game. And the teams that got a bye will come into the fold next week. Uh, for instance, number one ranked. Waconia Lakers buy in the first round. They won their region. Um, they don't play this weekend at all. So these, some of these games will be very good. Now, class B, there's only 16 teams in the tournament. They play the first two rounds, single elimination. And then when you reach the final four, it turns into a double elimination format. I covered through on my midweek bonus episode last week. Uh, it's kind of confusing how, how B works and it's, and it's kind of confusing a little bit of how C works. And then class A is halfway basically through their tournament already. They're going to wrap up their elite eight in the final four today. And then on Sunday, they're done. They play all their games in St. Anthony Village. They play at Palm Field. And so they're not part of the big uh, the program and everything here, but those are still some good games to watch. Uh, the way the seeding came out for class A I know there are other games today will be good, but that 10 a.m. game features the number one ranked team in the state versus the number two ranked team in the state in single elimination. That's wow. the game to be at, the 10 o'clock a.m. game. That's your Class A championship in my book. But the other games will also be good, but there are some teams in there that aren't ranked. There are some teams that got in there, I don't want to say by, by luck, but there's a fair amount of good teams in there, but that 10 a.m. game today is the one to watch. They're streaming all those games on Prep 45's uh, website as well. Uh, and so this weekend, Federal League over 35 senior men's baseball wrap up. They have class AAA, class AA, and class single A. That'll all be done here this weekend. And then the Senior Men's Baseball Association finishes up also their over 35 season. Um, their final state tournament is this weekend as well. So baseball will be done after this weekend for all the class A teams, for all the senior men's over 35 teams. And the amateur will be just be down to class B and C for the remaining three weeks. Now, for those following American Legion baseball, the World Series just got completed, Shelby, North Carolina. Idaho Falls won again. And again, meaning they won it last year. Very tough in American Legion to see back-to-back -back champions, but they won that, and, and the Legion season now is, is complete. So we're in a fun, fun time of the year. Everything's wrapping up. Now, trivia question. Yes. The answer to the trivia question, the question was, what's Byron Buxton's career average in the minors versus his career average in the majors? The answer is... In the minors, he's a 301 hitter, lifetime. 300 okay. hitter in the minors for Byron Buxton. Majors, he's a 247 <clears throat> hitter. And that actually has just oh. gone up in the last couple, couple of years. It, it was hovering around that 200 mark, very low 200s for a long time. And now he pushed it up. But he's a 247 lifetime hitter in the, in the majors. Nothing to sneeze at. Um, but boy... He is a good ball player at every level of the minor leagues. Uh, that guy uh, was a stud at every level. So now he's down there with the Saints. If you get a chance to watch uh, some games here with him there, he's going to perform. He can hit for power, average. Um, he's a five-tool athlete in the minors. Maybe right. He's kind of an easy out. Uh, you throw some certain pitches to him. But when he gets a hold of him, he is good. That's this week's trivia question. Going back to what you said about the, the Class B and Class C tournament, B only has 16 teams in it, C32. Is it because there's not that many teams that play B, or they just only have 16 teams in their, in their playoffs? 
So in class B, I think there's only, I think there's only 32 teams in the state that are actually oh, okay. class, class B. They do their own playoff postseason tournament to get down to 16 and 16 make the state. Okay. And so they use a criteria point-based system as well. How many guys, a certain number of points, if you've got a guy in your roster that played former major league baseball, if you've got okay. a guy in the roster, it's a different point. If they played former minor leagues, it's a different point system. If they played division one college or division two or Juco or no college at all. So they add up those points. And if you've got a whole bunch of your roster guys that have played minors, former pros and D one college, which a lot of these teams are made up of their entire, their rosters are stacked at the class right. level. They could be playing and taking on minor league teams at this level. That's how good the okay. pitching and the hitting is at class B. They're, they're mainly made up of professional ball players um, now. So there's only 16 of those left. They're good to watch, but class C is the fan favorite. People love the small town yep. class C baseball and it's single elimination. You're done. You're out, but there's 200 teams in, in class, roughly 200 teams uh, or so in class C only 48 make the state tournament. And after this weekend, they'll be down to 32 left. And then it goes down to 16, eight, four. Yep. We can all do the math, but it's, it's some good baseball at the class C level. That's the one where the biggest fans turn out. I think the biggest. Follow yeah. Up. I know for going to the games in Watertown here, they're just, it's a blast. It's, it's not like the minor league attitude atmosphere, but it is, you know, cause everybody knows everybody, you know, you know, the players like you do in some of the low A ball for minor leagues, right? before this year with the Saints when they played out in Midway. You just kind of knew the guys. So that's what's more fun. None of these players in C have a chip on their shoulder from what I've seen. Not saying there wasn't guys out there with a chip. I haven't seen them yet. And currently looking through the rosters, I mean, these Class C teams are loaded as well. Yep. Um, just because they don't meet the criteria to be a Class B team doesn't mean they're close. St. Patrick Irish – maybe have forced to, to move up to class B in the next year or two, because most of their lineup is, is current and college, former college guys. It's a college team, right? right. College all star Lakers, um, tons of college guys on these teams. They are, they are tough now, just because they don't have the criteria, they don't meet the threshold to be thrust into class B. Uh, Waconia, I think would do very well at a class B level and almost should be playing at class B St. Patrick Irish, same thing. Um, and those two, Many have picked to to face each other in the final in the finals for Class C, but these other teams, even if you sprinkle in three or four guys on your team that are playing D one or D two baseball currently, and just came off a 40, 60 game schedule, um, these, these there's there's there are no slouches in Class C. These these are um, typically your college, your high school studs on the team, your varsity guys, and also guys that went on to play multiple years in college at some level. And you see a bunch of guys at class C level that have played minor league baseball or the pros. Well, like you said last week, Laconia class C, their two losses were against a B and an A team. Yeah. They're undefeated in class C. Everybody yeah. they played in class C, they beat. This year. Yeah. And, and, and so they're predicted to go, you know, the plus they got the, the, the fact that they're going to be playing their home game. Most of the games will be at home in the state. Tournament. Right. So that's why they're going to be a heavy favorite. But boy, you know, you get a you get a team like the Loretto Larks. They yep. They're good on their team, you know, former major leaguer for many years. And the only reason Corey's on the team is that it's two younger, his two sons that currently play at a high level at college baseball, uh, recruited their dad to come out and play. So there's three guys right there that have all uh, between the three of them, college and pro backgrounds. So that's what we're up against for these class C teams. Very good. Now, when you started your career in town ball, did you and Coach Mike play on the same team? No, Coach Mike never played town ball, and I never played town ball. I mean, did you guys ever play on the same team in any leagues as you went up? No, uh, we both played over 35 baseball. Um, we played some town and country. Uh, my younger brother played a year in amateur for, for, for Jordan uh, years ago when they won that state tournament, but um, we never overlapped. As far as the number of years we've all been playing. Oh, so your younger brother goes, plays a year, gets a ring, and then quits. It's yes, yes. That's the way you're supposed to do it, right? Go out on top. That was 2004. And, and uh, that's the last year that, that my, 
my wife and I had season tickets to an amateur baseball team. It was 2004. We got tickets to the Jordan Brewers and went to all their home games. And they won the state. This year, my wife and I get season tickets to Waconia Lakers. And we wow. could, could jinx it. We don't want to jinx it, but they, if they win, that's the only two years I've ever been to a, a bunch of ball, a bunch of ball games in the summer for amateur. And so if Waconia wins it, other teams send your emails to Sports and Songs. Attention, Dan. So we could be two. We could be two for two. Uh, and yeah, you might be the. The only two times we get season tickets for an amateur, uh, they'll go on to win the state at home. Jordan won yeah. it when they hosted that year in 2004. The so that's Blues. the key. You got to get season tickets at, at home. They, so it's a, it's a, we don't want to jinx anything here, but uh, yeah, there's some, the good, there's some good teams. Classy. Season tickets and host it. You get season tickets, they host it, they win. That's, that's the formula. So yeah, who's now, hosting keep, next year? Now keep in mind, Hamburg is in the, not in the state, but they're hosting. Chaska is in the state and they're hosting, uh, but they've hosted several other times. So there's a, uh, it's not like we did this uh, on purpose, but it is going to be interesting <laughs> to see in the next three weeks what happens. But you didn't have season tickets for those teams either. No. See, that's the missing element. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we've got to, I think, all except three of the Crow River Valley baseball uh, uh, ballparks this year. So we've taken in a lot of baseball this year. And now, as you were waiting in the rain delay last night, and you're Sony Walkman. What were you listening to for your album review? Album of the week. Here's the album of the week. I'll pull it up here. <clears throat> the album of the week is Double Vision. Double Vision is the second studio album by British American rock band Foreigner. Here, let me pull it up here. Here we go. Little Foreigner. Never covered them before. First time here in Sports and Songs. And so they released this in June 1978 on Atlantic Records. Double Vision was the first in the line of many other recordings in which A&R executive John Kalodner would simply have his name listed twice in the liner notes as a play on the title of this album. The phrase John Kalodner, colon, John Kalodner, originator. When producer Olson, wondering just how to credit Kaladner's involvement in the band and the album in keeping with the idea of the double vision theme, guitarist Mick Jones came up with the idea of just putting his name in there twice, double vision. Now the song Tramontaine is the only instrumental track Foreigner has ever released on a studio album. That's on this album, it's an instrumental, the only instrumental. Foreigner doesn't have uh, instrumentals, but it's on this one. Now Mick Jones also takes the lead on the vocals on the song, Back Where You Belong, and I have waited so long. Album length, 37 minutes, 55 seconds. Released, uh, this was all recorded in the studio Sound City, Van Nuys, Cal uh, California, Sound City. And they call this genre, Andy, they call this hard rock and arena rock. Yeah, I'd throw that in there, yeah. I, I would call this, <clears throat> if anything, maybe soft rock, but... Uh, it is what it is. It's different. The album peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 charts and earned platinum certification a week after its release. It has now been certified platinum seven times. This album, seven times platinum. It's also Foreigner's best-selling album. The lead single released in June 1978 called Hot Blooded reached number three on the Billboard charts, followed up by Double Vision, which charted up as high as number two. And then third and final single was Blue Morning, Blue Day. That was released in December and climbed to number 15 on the chart. Los Angeles Times critic Robert Hilburn described Double Vision as slickly produced, commercially powerful, but artistically vapid. The record critic Rick Atkinson said the album was that it used the same formula as, form, as Foreigner's debut album. Whereas you can almost call this album Foreigner's clone. They use the same, you know, strategy on this album as the uh, as the first album. So there were some dis <clears throat> folks not too happy with that. As far as it's very similar, a couple, three, four good songs. The rest kind of uh, throwaways. Throw it out there and sell seven million yeah. records. 
Here's the track listing. Song one, Hot Blooded. Song two, Blue Morning, Blue Day. And those two, very good mm -hmm. songs. Uh, then it drops off with uh, song three, You're All I Am. Song four, Back Where You Belong. That song is Love Has Taken Its Toll, which is pretty good. Then yep. get to song six, Double Vision, excellent. Uh, great, great music, actually music video as well. Song seven is Tremontaine. That's the instrumental. And the final three songs are I Have Waited So Long, Lonely Children, and Spellbinder to round out the album. Now here's the personnel. Lou Graham, lead vocals. Ten songs here. One of them is an instrumental, so and he didn't sing on two of the songs because Mick Jones did. So you know, seven, seven songs for Lou Graham. Mick Jones is lead guitar, but also lead vocals on two songs. Ian McDonald, guitars, keyboards. Al Greenwood, keyboards. Dennis Elliott on drums. And then Ed Gallardi on bass. And so Ed Gallardi was bass. This was his last album that he was on for Foreigner. Uh, Rick Wills took over on bass after that. Rick Wills. So once again, some very good songs. A lot of radio airtime. You'll hear a lot of these songs. Tupper bands, yeah. In the Bars. And you figure, you say that was one of the best-selling albums, <clears throat> considering how uh, Adrian Provocator came out when MTV started with I Want to Know What Love Is and how yeah. that album isn't their top selling. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that those sold, I think they went four or five times platinum as well, those other big albums, but this was yeah. seven, seven times platinum. Now, if you go see Foreigner now, Lou Graham's still in the band, but he plays drums. Okay. Kelly Hansen, or Hansen is the lead singer, and he used to be in a band, um, Hurricane. He was in Hurricane. Okay. And Jeff Pilson, former bass player for Dokken, now plays bass for Foreigner. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. So, and Mick Jones is still there because Mick Jones is just that good. Um, so, yeah, so, so if you go see Foreigner, you can say, I like Lou Graham's solo stuff after he left Foreigner a lot better. Um, Midnight Blue was his first solo single he released. That's a good one. And he's got some other stuff really good. The reasons why he's playing drums, I do not know. I've not looked into the foreigner history why. I was just looking at the lineup stuff the other day when we were talking about this. So I don't know if maybe age, he just can't pull off the notes anymore. He admitted it. Who knows? Um, he's still touring with the band playing drums, so he's still got a say in the matter. But, um, that's that for that one. But yes, a lot of these bands um, you see going out, you said you see Jeff Pilson on bass now from another – Band, so yeah, so he's always older bands. Kind of looks like an all star band in a way. Yeah, four of that. They were maybe not hard rock, but I'd call them arena rock for whatever they consider yeah. arena rock. Hard rock. Can okay, you look at the album cover? Look at the long hair and the leather. That's long. That's hard rock. That's probably where they got thrown in that one. But I, yeah, they're they're rock and roll. They're arena rock. Very good album. Very good choice. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, that's all I've got for this week uh, on music, sports, albums, concerts, uh, nothing else. This this, uh, this week's midweek uh, episode should be pretty good. We'll be covering all the baseball that wrapped up on this current week. And like I said before, this upcoming week, weekend, I should say, the upcoming weekend is really one of the best in Class B and C baseball all year long. Now, the final week, Labor Day weekend, is really just the final four uh, th those are, of course, going to be good games, but uh, that's the heavy hitters are going to make it out there. The big, the big dogs. But this the big second, second weekend is is going to be all around good baseball. Lots of baseball. Yes. Well, that's all got. Uh, anything else for uh, this week's episode? That's all I got. Um, just like I said, how about page two? Any plug for page two? Page two stuff. We might recap Canadian football this week. I haven't decided yet because we've got half the games here. A lot of big news in wrestling. AEW last night, CM Punk made his return to TV. You can watch those highlights on YouTube like I did this morning. 
um, for CM Punk fans, AEW fans. He's back. Um, made his big announcements for his matches. And of course, hometown guy made his return in his hometown, so the crowd is a little louder than, say, any other city. Not saying it wouldn't be loud, but you do it in your hometown, it's a little better. Now the Vikings play today, Indianapolis Colts, second preseason game for the Vikings fans out there. But that's all I've got for this week. Um, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you next time. See ya. Bye.